and welcome back everyone to Jersey Beach Volley Podcast. I'm your host, Rohan Chatella, and today we've got another amazing guest and local legend, Greg Hunter. Now, if you don't remember who Greg is, you might remember the legend of Sweaty Wendy or Captain Speedo, although the latter has actually been laid to rest now. Come take a trip down memory lane as Greg recounts some of his favorite memories playing the sport and shares some tips on how to improve your game during the quarantine. All right, everyone, welcome back to the show. And today we've got another local legend. We have Gregory Hunter. So, Greg, thank you so much for joining us today. How's it going? Everything's good. I mean, I'm usually only called Gregory when I'm in trouble. So, <laughs> uh, I appreciate that intro and then you changing it immediately yeah, to Greg. Yeah, no, so, don't uh, worry. This is not the principal's office. So, don't worry about that. You're not in trouble here. If anything, you're going to be here to tell a story. So, the complete opposite of that. So, how, how's it going, man? Awesome. How's everything been with you? Uh, quarantine is crazy with two kids and, uh, and no time to do anything, especially for myself. So just trying to make sure that my wife and two kids are all taken mm-hmm. care of and, and, uh, and live in life inside my house as much as I possibly can without, uh, throwing my kids against the wall. And <laughs> <laughs> oh, man, no, that's definitely, that's definitely tough when you're stuck in the house with two young little kids and you have your wife and making sure all parties and all stakeholders are taken care of. So Hey, hats off to you yeah. that you're you're juggling the world right now. <laughs> yeah, thanks, man. No Netflix and chill in no. this house. That's for, that's for darn sure. Hey, hopefully, you know hopefully eventually you get there. But for now, you got to take care of these things. So, <laughs> yeah, they say 18 years. So I guess I countdown starts now. <laughs> oh man. Okay. Cool. Awesome. <laughs> um, so I guess I mean for the people who don't know you, I guess the best way to describe you off the bat would be you're you're you are a local legend. You've had success on virtually every level of the game at the high school level, at the college club level, on the beach. And so normally the way I begin my segments is by kind of talking through with the guest, you know, about their early life and to see the reason I do that is because I want to understand if there were any poignant moments or any monumental moments in their early life and their childhood that really set them up for success. So maybe instead of really diving deep, I'll just ask you, like, do you have anything that sticks out to you that you'd want to share about your early life? Or was that not so much a big factor in your later on success in volleyball? No, I'd say that was a a huge factor in in who I am as a person. Um, I have an older brother. He's five years older. His name's Nick. Um, And being five years older, he was always bigger, stronger, faster, more athletic and, and always good at sports. So uh, my love for sports really, really started with him. And I always idolized him and we would compete, whether it was soccer, basketball, running on the beach, um, everything was a competition for him. Um, and like I said, he was always better. Mm. So growing up, I was always the little brother who, who lived in my brother's okay. shadow. Um, so, so that was, that was frustrating, which, but at the same time, you know, he played soccer and basketball and so did I. And then freshman year in high school came around and, and volleyball tryouts were, were there. And I said, well, this, this seems pretty cool. And I tried out for the team after never really playing volleyball before and was the last one to make the team <laughs> and, and found a way to, to kind of create my own niche and be my own person and, and succeed in something different than my mm-hmm. brother. So, uh, you know, that competition with my brother really, really created my, my uh, competitiveness. Um, but, you know, I found my own thing in volleyball. Gotcha. So when you tried out for the volleyball team, you mentioned that you were the last pick. And so can you dive a little bit deeper into that? How did that affect you mentally? How did that, you know, how did you, how did you respond to that? How did you react to that? At the time, I, I didn't think much of it. I mean, I thought it was, it was a cool sport and East Brunswick at the time was a mm-hmm. dynasty and just being on the team was, uh, was an honor. So I felt very honored to be on the team with, with guys that I really looked up to and, and having no real experience with volleyball, that was the extent of a volleyball in my life. So looking up to the juniors and the seniors on that team, um, I was in awe at, at what the, the games looked like, how competitive mm-hmm. it was, and, and how loud the gym would get, and how excited everybody mm-hmm. was, especially playing against our, our rival St. Joe's <laughs> at the time. It was uh, everything up pretty intense, and, and that was something that, that really uh, gave me the drive to to want to be something and work really hard gotcha. at it. And for for people listening, I don't I don't think people really understand what how much of it when you say dynasty, how much of a dynasty East Brunswick really was because for the longest time, Central Jersey has dominated the New Jersey high school boys volleyball scene, and G, the GMC conference has constantly constantly been the best conference. And so that dynasty was always you and what St. Joe's like East Brunswick St. Joe's and maybe Old Bridge a little bit. 
always fighting for the GMC yeah. spot? Yeah, it was always us and Joe's mm-hmm. when when I was in school. It was always us and Joe's, and it was you know we would we would take it more often than they would, but it was definitely back and forth, and and there was absolutely uh, a rivalry mm-hmm. between the two of us. Gotcha. So maybe shifting a little bit away from sports in high school, just what about academics wise, student life wise? Were you a great student? What was your favorite subject? Or was that a lot? Of, my last two guests have told me so far that school wasn't the biggest priority. Sports was life. And then somehow they eventually made a click. So was that the same case for you? Yeah, I'd say school was uh, was really important mm. to me. Um, you know, growing up, I, I always was a quiet kid. So I was pretty smart. I really enjoyed math. So, I, you know, throw numbers in front of me and, and, and I'm really, I'm really good. Mm-hmm. So um, as soon as they started getting into variables and exponent, you know, and, and other stuff besides just mm-hmm. numbers, it was a little bit more complicated for me. But um, I think that math was something that I saw myself um, doing something with for my life. Um, but, you know, school was, was the vessel by which to play volleyball yeah. my junior, my junior and senior mm-hmm. years. So it's amazing how it transitioned from, um, from just wanting to get good grades to be successful in life to, you know, the good grades and the, the study habits were there already. And now it's, it's time to, to get down to business and play some volleyball. I got gotcha. you. That makes sense to me. And it's funny you mentioned that because for me and my relationship with math was my high school coach was also my physics teacher. So this man during physics class, he'd be like, you know, you have to understand the angles. You got to understand the vectors, the velocity, <laughs> the ball's coming at this way. The angle of deflection is that. And like, it was a lot of math. I wasn't the best at it. I was more of a science nerd. But, you know, if you can appreciate the science of the sport, then it makes it a little bit easier. No, I 100% agree. You know, the spin, the like you said, the angles, it's all it's all related to your uh, the way that you move your body to react to the, to the mm-hmm. opponent. Um, and it's really when, when you can get to that upper level where it doesn't matter what the opponent's doing, you know, they're not going to be able to stop you. And that's a really cool I feeling. Agree. No, I agree. And so being a student of the game, that's, I think that's kind of the theme I'm getting at here from at a high school level, how much of a student of the game were you, or was it more of relying on your teammates and more of like a brute force kind of approach? I mean, I don't know how many people on this actually know who I am, but you know, I'm five ten, and I'm not particularly strong or uh, lanky or fast or athletic. Um, I'm nothing really special in terms of a person. So I feel like all of my success came from just like using the little things that I could do mm-hmm. well to my advantage. So for instance, right. So obviously I'm not going to be a big block, but I can soft block. Mm-hmm. But you know, one thing I can control is a serve. So I always said, all right, being able to control the serve and serve really tough makes, you know, takes a big player out of the game if they can't pass. So I always said, I got to serve tough every single time to give myself mm-hmm. a chance. And on the other side, I got to be able to pass well, because if I can't pass well, you know, I'm going to get served all day. You know, I got to be able to put the ball where I need to put it to be able to give myself an opportunity to make a shot or to hit a ball. Cause I'm not going to be able to hit a ball, you know, off a transition set as well as somebody who's six, five, six, six, that's just not realistic. Yeah. So, and then, you know, setting, if I can, you know, set the ball, then I can play with somebody who's a little bit bigger, who's better, who's going to be willing to do the blocking and, you know, just setting yourself up to, to be successful in in a team environment. Okay, cool. So then maybe just expound a little bit about your favorite memory in high school. Obviously you had a couple championships under your belt, but was there one that meant more than the other? Or was there one that was, you know, a little sweeter than the others? I'm sure they're all sweet, but your favorite one. So my favorite was actually my sophomore year. Um, my sophomore year playing against St. Joe's in their old gym. Um, we were number six in the state at the time. They were number one in the state. They had uh, player of the year, Pat Fenton, on mm-hmm. their team. who was, He was a beast. He was like a 6'4 lefty, and he was just, you know, he would demolish the ball, and he would own us. Um, and we, were, we had a rebuilding year, and it was, like I said, it was my sophomore year, so I was playing DS, um, serving specialist at the time. Um, later on in the year, I would have played opposite, but at that time, that's what mm-hmm. it was. And we got to a third game, and Kevin Suchowicki, our outside, had a monster game, and it put us in the position where it was a 13-13 game three. And, oh, man. And this was back when you guys only played to 15, up. correct? Yeah, this is side-out scoring. Oh, okay, yeah. So, so this is the last year of side-out scoring, and I went back and I served an ace. They called timeout, and I served the ace oh. to, to beat the number one team in the, in the state. Mm-hmm. And 
oh man, it was awesome. That was the coolest thing. And I, you know, yeah, sure. I served two aces at the end of the game, but I'm not the reason that we won the game, but it was pretty cool finishing <laughs> it off. Oh man. Talk about moments that matter. I think those are the kinds of moments where, you know, a, you make or break the kind of person you are, but they are the moments that also stick with you for the rest of your life. Like they get burned into the back of your brain as a memory. So Totally. That's a, it was a small gym. There were people upstairs. There was no, there were no fans on our own level. So every scream was coming from up top. It was, it was surreal. I mean, my brother was there screaming, cursing at me. <laughs> he, was, <laughs> he brought all of his mm-hmm. friends because it was St. Joe. That was, that was the East Brunswick St. Joe's yeah. rivalry. So, you know, all my crew was there. It was, uh, it was really awesome, especially from some, coming from me who wasn't really expected to make an impact mm-hmm. on the game. So that was that was really awesome. Awesome. That's uh, thanks for sharing that. I think that was that was a great memory to expound upon. So appreciate it. So then okay, so we can yeah. wrap up high school there. High school ends with a bang and you end up going to Rutgers, right? Yep, that's right. Rutgers New Brunswick. Rutgers New Brunswick. And so did you have aspirations to play at the collegiate level like NCAA or was that kind of out of the picture? No, I, I really would have wanted mm-hmm. to. Um, in fact, I would reached out to um, Sean Leonard, who was the coach of Rutgers Newark at the mm-hmm. time. And I really wanted to play at Rutgers, and, and, but I, you know, I didn't want to go necessarily to Newark um, unless I was guaranteed a spot. Mm-hmm. Um, New Brunswick, right down the road from my house. My parents wanted me to go there from, since I was a kid. I wanted to go there since I was a kid. Um, but I also wanted to play volleyball. But at the same time, um, I didn't really want to go to to Rutgers Newark and and be a little bit further away and not the environment I was looking to be in at the time unless I was guaranteed a spot. And he pretty much told me that uh, I wasn't six three or above, so he wasn't interested in in looking at tapes or really offering me a position. Mm. And I said, okay, no problem. Um, I'll just go to Rutgers New Brunswick and play club with all my boys. Mm. So that's what I did, and it was a great decision. <laughs> I, I don't regret it. Hey, I mean, I'm, as a as a former Rutgers alum as well myself on the Rutgers club team. I think Rutgers Club has been, I mean, I got to play for six years, so it was the best six years of my life. I went to pharmacy school, but somehow I didn't even right. realize I get to play for six years. So that was amazing. And I'm sure you have some probably sick memories from being a Rutgers Club member. So maybe you could tell us a little <laughs> bit first about what the structure of the club was like back then, how you guys played and all everything like that. And then after that, we can transition to the craziness. Sure. So um, the structure was really Jamie Hoare. Jamie was was the coach. He was the guy who set up all the practices. Um, he was the guy who was always at Rutgers, making sure everything was taken mm-hmm. care of. So he was he was pretty much the the foundation of Rutgers Club. Period. Uh, which is which is awesome. Like Jamie's the best. Um, all he cares about is us and us having a good time and and enjoying what we're doing and be, getting better at mm-hmm. volleyball. Um, so we'd have practice uh, twice a week, Tuesday, Thursdays, and then, um, you know maybe like five tournaments a, a semester um and just go to tournaments and and play our play our butts mm-hmm. off so it was, uh, it was a good time and then come home and and have a good time together <laughs> and did you go to nationals every year yes we went to nationals every okay. year and and you know like i said the volleyball was fun but you know that the camaraderie associated with it um out off the volleyball court was uh was probably just as much fun if not more so in those four years of nationals what was the the tour which which cities if you remember did you guys hit up oh man um dallas kansas city um louisville Uh, yeah it's hard to it's hard to differentiate Mm -hmm. college national high school Mm -hmm. nationals to be honest with you Uh, those are those are three i'm pretty sure that we want to so then uh, my next question has to obviously be which one was your favorite um dallas dallas was my my favorite nationals and like i said it it wasn't really because of the volleyball um it was actually a really crazy whole experience we uh we got our flight it was like a nine o'clock flight and at that time american airlines had an issue where um some cables weren't connected close enough together so they grounded all american airlines flight so our 10 o'clock flight for both the men's and the women's team turned into like an 8 p.m. Oh flight. So, so instead of getting to Dallas at like two o'clock in the afternoon, we got there at like 11 o'clock <laughs> and, and we get to the hotel. And of course, everybody from nationals is staying mm-hmm. there. And we're obviously the last ones. And they're like, we don't have any more regular rooms for oh you. And we're like, we're like, what do you mean? They're like, yeah, we, we just don't. They're like, well, we have like five regular rooms and we have five suites. 
And <laughs> I looked at, at Jamie and my boy Manny, and I was like, all right, Manny, you and me, we got a suite. So we we got this awesome room where it was a bedroom in one side, and it was like this big open space, probably like 20 feet by 20 feet, which, which is a living room. Oh my God. And Manny and I, we, we both looked at each other when we got in there, and we said party spot. <laughs> so... So my my most fond memory was coming back on our last day or our second to last day of playing and having all the freshmen with two 18 packs in each arm and met everybody in the whole crew. Everybody just had two 18 packs on each arm and taking this tram from the convention center to the hotel and everybody in the tram being like, where are you guys from and what are you doing tonight? <laughs> Uh, we had this huge blowout party. My boy Tony from Berkeley brought his Berkeley boys. We had all these girls from Kansas. It was a it was a crazy night until we got kicked oh out. Oh my gosh! That sounds like so, that sounds like a lot of fun, a lot of ruckus, and hmm. a lot of debauchery. Hopefully, yeah. I mean, I'm sure you guys. Wait, when you say first of all, when you say Manny, you're talking about Manny Rodel. I can't even say his last name, but Manny R, right? <laughs> yeah, Manny Rodesakis. That's yes, fine. Yes, yes. Um, that's my boy. He and I, he and I were, uh, yeah, we got, had a lot of fun at Rutgers. No club, way. That's so sure. funny. I, I, I mean, Manny is like the, the man. So I, I played with him a couple tournaments last summer. Obviously you're not around as much anymore, but I'm sure if you were, you guys probably be yeah. playing together at some, at some point. Right. Yeah. We've played with and against each other mm-hmm. for, for years. Yeah. And yeah, Manny was, it's funny. Manny was the guy who was the, he made the vo- volleyball team our senior year in high school. And he was the guy who had never really played organized volleyball. And me and Tony Yates um, were basically like told our coach that they had to take Manny. <laughs> so, so we told Manny that if he's made the team, he had a requirement that he would do this thing called Dance Manny Dance. Now, Manny is is Greek and he danced in this Greek Orthodox dance group. So every every game, every, every <laughs> day before the game, every all of us would get in a circle and we'd all start clapping, dance, Manny, dance. <laughs> Dance, Manny, dance, and Manny oh. would do this awesome Greek dance. Come down with this finishing move, and we and finishing move, and we'd all go crazy and get ready for the oh game. That was God. it. That was, That's hilarious. That was our time to start playing thing. Yeah, <laughs> I can imagine that too. That's perfect. I know <laughs> he's having a kid soon as well. So, I mean, hopefully, yes, once, he the, once the baby's a little taken care of and we can see him back on the beach, we're gonna get the entire of the Point Pleasant crowd to just start screaming at him. Dance, Manny, dance. Dance, Manny, dance. Yes, <laughs> yes, he will. He will do oh, it too because that's Manny. Perfect. He doesn't care. He goes hard. I <laughs> we'll love have him. you on Facetime too, just to make sure you're not missing out. <laughs> yes, please, please. You know, you know, I probably won't be there with two kids. <laughs> hey, you got to make at least one trip back down this summer. You have to at least just once. Listen, if this thing if this opens up, I will be at the beach for sure this All summer. Right, cool. Not a question. Cool. I got you. Awesome. So I think the next topic that I definitely want to dive into is the beach career. So we've we got a little glimpse into your high school career and your indoor career and all the fun you had there. But obviously, the main focus of this podcast is the beach game. And you have had a lot of success on the beach. So when did you start playing beach? And when did you start taking it seriously? Um, I started playing beach after my freshman year playing at the season. So, you know, the season was over in June. And then Tony Yates, you know, inevitably dragged me down to the beach. I'll never forget our first tournament. Drove down to Belmar and it was rained out. And so so Tony and I would go to, go to the Rutgers courts, um, you know, twice a week, Tuesdays and Thursdays, and watch – Watch the big dogs, the Donnie Satchows, uh, you know, go out there and, and play on the other side where the pool is now. Uh, for the you know that mm-hmm. um, they used to set up their own courts yeah. and, and ball out, and then everybody else who wasn't at that level used to play on the other side. So um, Tony dragged me out and then introduced me to Fred Siegel, um, who you know those two people are are definitely the most influential people in my life in terms of volleyball. You know, they both they both mm-hmm. helped spark the fire in me and. And Fred actually gave me the the biggest motivation I think I had in my career. Um, you know, so after our freshman year playing, I was playing with Tony the whole summer playing B, and I think the the best we ever got was like third. Um, and mm-hmm. after that, Fred said, "Tony, you got to stop playing with this kid. He's never going to be good." So Tony moved on. He played with other guys, and so did I. And I started playing A the next year and started doing well. Um, and then maybe like you know five years later, when I won my first Open tournament. Um, I heard that Fred had said that about me. I didn't. I didn't necessarily know at the time, but you know, he said that about me, and and I was like, you know, Fred, I proved you wrong, and he admitted it. He's like, yep, you, I definitely was wrong on that one. But 
yeah, that was that was how my beach volleyball career started. Oh yep. man, that's the fire in the belly. That's that's totally. crazy. Yeah, it was you know I played club for Fred for for four years. He was my coach. He would drive me to practice um, every week, mm-hmm. um, and, and he he had no problem admitting that he was wrong at the end. So it was uh, you know <laughs> prove the haters wrong. That's that's what it's all about. Mm-hmm. I got you. I got you. So then, with it's so funny you mentioned the Rutgers courts because now it's it's not like that anymore. Like the big dogs don't really play there. I feel like a lot of people play at maybe Freehold or down at the shore. Maybe I'm not even sure. But what was it like back then? Who else was there? Were, were like the other like Ehor and those guys were there too? Or was oh, it like, man. and was it the workup court system? It was like was it, it was it was funny. So yeah, like I said, the the one side where Donnie Satchow. Um, oh man, I don't even remember who else was there. Um, oh, this was so long ago. I can't even like the guys were just so good. I didn't even know who they were because I wasn't even that close to that that level. <laughs> you know? um, yeah. I just remember Tony and I playing against these two guys, Langster and Fatty Mac is what we call them. And there was this really skin Asian guy and this really and this uh uh-huh. this like overweight um like brown guy like you know maybe Puerto Rican guy. So we called him Fatty. Mac. Uh-huh. And and we we did a battle with these guys, and it was always a good game. Uh, that whole year, it was good games. Um, then the next year, we came out and we started beating them down. But that was it. it's crazy how how little you remember about like the good players back then. You just, I was just in such awe of watching them. Mm-hmm. I know what you mean, and it's like you watch these amazing players, and you don't you just aspire and you only hope that you could be as good as them. And when you, if, when, when you get to that level, it's just like, you're like, what is that? How, how did that even happen? You forget all the hard work that goes in between. It's just like a, it's like, yeah, a it wasn't almost. even like that for me though, because I really thought that I had no chance of ever getting to that level. So I never was mm-hmm. like, Oh my God, they're amazing. I can't wait to be that. I was like, that's just unattainable <laughs> at times, <laughs> honestly. And then, and then things started changing mm-hmm. and they stopped coming around. And then, um, Tony and I started doing really well and, and, you know, bringing some guys to those courts and then training on those courts and, and started doing better in the summers. And, and it all just kind of transpired and turned into, you know, us playing all the time and, and getting better. And then, you know, eventually started doing well in tournaments and making a little money. Mm-hmm. Okay. So then what would you say was the main thing that helped you close that gap and, kind of um, going off of that what would, what should people be doing right now during this quarantine like if you were still in the game right now what would you be doing right now to help get better and close the gap so so my wife is also an unbelievable volleyball player i mean she's way better than i am um so if i was still playing hard and didn't have kids i'd be peppering with her all day every day um You know, Mm -hmm. the thing that I did back in the day to try to get better was just playing all the time and just thinking about volleyball all the time so mm-hmm. like I think that the example I think of all the time is uh, I would just be walking down the street and there'd be that tree that was hanging down and I'd do my, my approach and, and try to hit the tree. And then the next time I'd try to hit it yep. a little bit higher or, you know, you have the, the door frame on your house and you hit that, you know, the, oh, yeah. the infant right. So frame, you have yep. so many fingerprints on that door frame and your parents get so mad, but you know, you can't help it because that's just, that's just the itch that mm-hmm. you got in you to just jump and practice and Mm -hmm. you know i remember laying in my bed and setting balls to myself um so it's just like these little things that you that you take for granted but like as soon as you get that bug um you don't want to put the ball down you don't want to stop thinking about volleyball because it it really grabs you so hard like that yeah it's it's it really is a drug and i think my coach would always 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 tell us that like this was his favorite quote. There's more to life than volleyball, but not to a volleyball player. And that's like something that's always stuck yeah. with me. It's always stuck with me. And I think for people who catch the bug, that's a, that's 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 the truth. There's there's not more to life than volleyball to a I volleyball mean, player. It definitely, life definitely changes as you get older. Uh, and I've and I've yeah. recently started to to understand that. Um, but yeah, for for 15 years of my life, volleyball was was definitely top three things in my life. Uh, you know, family, mm-hmm. girls, and volleyball. Those are <laughs> <laughs> okay. Perfect. Now that you've mentioned girls, then I think I need to segue into my next topic, and it's regard. It's related to the beach game, but it's re- more in line with your iconic look. And I think I don't. I mean, I don't know, but I'm just saying that 
you might have been like the the style icon legend for rocking the speedo right is that is that accurate and how did that happen it's like i said it's it's hard to look at yourself as an icon like i just so all right so here's here's the backstory all right um i worked at a restaurant when i was in college at rutgers and i worked uh verve in somerville so it was like fine dining steak restaurant um and two of the head waiters were gay and they were awesome, and you know, we, we was like a, it was like a family. It was me, and my boy Tom Lanza, who also plays beach volleyball, who oh, yeah, is still yeah, my Tom boy, is. and and these two other waiters, mm-hmm. and um, this guy Marcelo. He went to Brazil because he was Brazilian, and they called me Wendy because I like to I sweat a lot when I worked, <laughs> and they're like sweaty, sweaty Wendy because they had a girl for everybody. <laughs> so they called me Wendy, and he went to Brazil, and he brought back this uh, this green and white speedo from Brazil. Um, so, you know, up until that point, I had never really worn a speedo before, but, um, back then the board shorts were not what they are today. They were like, you know, uh-huh. um, very plastic. Well, Super no, they were long. plastic. The fabric was very okay. different. It was, it wasn't stretchy. It wasn't comfortable. They were just, you know, they, they beaded water, but there was a price to pay for that. It was like a tarp, you know, just wearing a pair a tarp mm-hmm. on your pants, on your legs. Um, so it would rub. So I started wearing a speedo underneath my board shorts because to prevent you know friction. Because when you're sweaty and stuff's mm-hmm. rubbing around, it's you know it can lead to some some bad things. So so I started wearing a speedo and I had one tournament. I don't I don't remember if this is the first time, but um, I remember we were playing. Tony and I were playing in a um, a Dominican Republic flyaway trip, and we were playing against Mark Burek and Tim McNichol in East End at Long Beach, New York. And this is like, they had televised it and they had done all this, you know, stuff. And, and, you know, this is maybe 2011 where stuff wasn't on YouTube, stuff wasn't, it was like on WVVH TV, TV of the Hamptons. And that was like a really cool thing for me. But I was, I was playing mm-hmm. terribly. Um, you know, I couldn't dig a ball. I couldn't pass. I was shanking. I was missing serves. Um, and we were down big. We were down like 17, 11 or something. And I just got so frustrated that I was like, something's got to change. And I pulled down my shorts and there was this deal. <laughs> so, so that game, we came back, we, we started playing really well and we ended up winning that game. Um, and then we ended up winning the match in three. And ever since it's like, you know, when you get into that, that funk or you're not playing well or something's not going right, you know, at least you can break out the speedo. And I don't know if I played any better, but it might have been intim- it might have intimidated other people more than it made me play better. Let's put it that. Oh so, my god. That's so it hilarious. just became the thing. And and everybody who who played against me knew there was the possibility of of if I wasn't playing well or if the game wasn't going my way that that I could break into the speedo. And to be honest with you, a lot of people they they faltered under it. And it was pretty it was pretty awesome. It was a huge competitive advantage for me for a long time. Um, you know, and then, and then obviously it stopped working as well because I stopped playing as much, but at the same time it was, uh, it was fun. It was really fun. It was, it was like an alter ego. I think, uh, you know, Seth or, you know, Phil from, from Facebook, you know, he, uh, you know, he, he, I kind you know, he called me captain speedo. So, so that was like my alter ego, which is, which is cool. So it was, uh, Mm. you know, it was a cool part of my life. And unfortunately, during my vows with my wife, she hated it. Um, you know, I gave it up. So you won't be seeing any more speedo from me. Uh, my... <laughs> Come on, it has to make a return at some point. Once, just one more. Dude, it's my vows, time. man. It's it's no joke. It's pretty serious. All right, <laughs> All right fine. I can respect that. That's how much she that. hates it. <laughs> oh my god. Okay, then maybe she's probably gonna hate the story that I want you to explain a little bit. After this, then, all right, I'm just going to say three words, and if you know, mm-hmm. you know, but you're going to explain anyway. So here I go. White Thorn yes. Lodge. So <laughs> that was, that was a, a very unusual and interesting experience from a volleyball perspective. Um, wow. Playing volleyball at a nudist lodge. Um, never, thought, never thought that I would have said that, um, but I guess, I guess that's part of my, my legacy, so to speak, right, Rohan? <laughs> Mm-hmm. I know it is. It is. When you have articles being written about you on ESPN about that, I think that's part yeah, of the that was a that was a really random thing. And, and you're right. It did it did transpire from the speedo wearing incident. Um, but it was like it was like a really random thing. It was a guy who I had played against on URI at Rutgers Club. 
was friends with this guy Gary Needich, who's you know a Rutgers beach volleyball indoor volleyball guy that you know he's he's well known around Rutgers for a long time, um, and he got me in contact with um, this guy Eddie Matz, who called me and is like, hey, I'm you know I'm looking to uh, you know put a team together for this ESPN the magazine thing for this tournament that's been around for forty years. Um, so what would you think? And I was like. It sounds sounds pretty cool. Like you're going to be writing an article on ESP in the magazine about about a team about a volleyball tournament. And you want me to be in it? Like sounds good. I'm in. He's like, yeah, but there's one other thing. It's it's at a nudist lodge. Um, and I, I was like, okay, so so what does that mean? He's like, so like you'd be playing volleyball naked. I was like, wow, okay, that's um, it's a pretty crazy thing to ask somebody to do. <laughs> so you know i i was dating this girl at the time and we ended up actually breaking up over it but um he i i, I tried to get wow. a few guys to go i tried to get my boy matt ogan to go um tony wouldn't go my boy brian hughes wouldn't go manny wouldn't go so so mm-hmm. nobody nobody mm-hmm. ended up coming with me but it was no one was rising none, to of, the none of my boys were coming with me but so we played on this team with two professional girls from um, one was from canada another was from california and this writer from ESPN the magazine, and these two just random guys. And there were, mm-hmm. <laughs> I'll never forget, you pull up. So, so we pulled up in this, these RVs, and you pull up to the sign that says White Thorn Lodge. And they open up these gates, and, and I don't know what to expect, right? I've never been at a nudist lodge before. I don't know, like, am I supposed to be naked going into the nudist lodge? Like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so many questions, right? You just, you yeah, just don't like, like, am I, like, <laughs> what's going on here? Like, how am I supposed to act here? Um, so we pull up and the first person is wearing this orange reflective vest, um, flannel shirt and no pants. So the guy's dong is just hanging out and it's like, it's like 50 (laughs) degrees. So it's like, it's like, you're really going out of your way here to just be naked. Right. And like, like, listen, I I love being naked. It's a fantastic thing. But at the same time, like, like the women are in, you know, same thing. They're in like, like, uh, like parkas, but their tits are popping out. So, (laughs) (laughs) So that was oh. that was my first experience, and there were only two. There were only two times mm-hmm. that you really had to be naked, and that was when you were playing volleyball and when you were in the pool or sauna. So, so you could walk around okay. the place, and you can be completely clothed for the entire time, except when you were playing in the tournament or in the pool. So, it, it was okay. a pretty surreal experience. Um, the first game of the day on the first day, where everybody on my team is like, "All right, I guess this is it." They blow the whistle to for everybody to go on the court. And everybody just drops trial, and that was like it was one of the most liberating and <laughs> crazy, crazy feelings that I've ever had in my life. Was it like a pure rush of like adrenaline, or was it just like calmness? Like describe. Oh, that it was feeling. it was pure adrenaline. I mean, just just think about it, right? Just think about okay. being in a room full of people, and and knowing that, and just like you kind of imagine what they look like naked sort of right always like you kind of imagine mm-hmm. what they look like under their clothes but imagine that like everybody's yeah. just going to get naked at the same time so like you're you're mm-hmm. kind of feel exposed but you kind of feel comfortable at the same time but kind of intrigued because you want to see what everybody really looks uh-huh. like naked <laughs> so, so all of a sudden yeah. you care a little yeah. bit less about you being naked and a little bit more about everybody else being naked so you can look at them Mm-hmm. Um, and then, you know, there's probably like two minutes of that feeling. And then all of a sudden it, it goes, it switches immediately to volleyball time, right? Time, time to go. Yeah. And then the nakedness stopped mattering and it all started to be about, about playing hard and trying to win. Yeah. Was it any, was it like an obstacle at all to just be so free and have no clothes on? Or like, did you feel like you were, you know, moving faster, jumping higher? That Definitely kind of not moving faster or jumping higher based on the quantity of inebriation during the process. Oh. So um, I might've felt like I was, um, <laughs> but I wasn't. So, so the other fun part was that uh, whenever there was like a good play that happened, you know, what do you do in volleyball? Right. When, when one of your boys makes a sick play, what do you do? You have to daff them up. You got to scream. You got to like do some sort of primal. Like, All right. Embrace. So, so I guess, I guess what I do, I guess, which is a little bit differently is, you know, I go directly for the butt, you know, I smack ass. Like I go hard. Like okay. any partner right. I've ever had, Tony, Mike Salek, Eeyore, like everybody knows, you know, Andy Wimmer, all these guys know that, you know, if you want to play with me, you got to expect to get your ass slapped. That's just the way. Okay. So, okay. So, so all of a sudden <laughs> I get girls on my team and they do good stuff. And I'm like, uh, do I hold back? Do I go for it? 
So, so finally, you know, the first good play comes, the girl puts the ball away and I'm like, here you go. Whoop. And I, and I smacked her in the ass and it's like, that's volleyball, right? It's not sexual. It's just, that's volleyball. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. That's, Hey, that, it is what it is. It's that's how it's the sport and that's how you guys played. So yeah, you shouldn't play any differently when you're naked as you do when you're, when you're not naked with the exception of the fact that it was on a tennis court. So the one rule that we had is that you don't dive, right? Because I'm not trying to dive mm-hmm. on a tennis court because, uh, you know, it's not a gym floor where you slide. It's not sand where it's soft. It's like if you hit the ground, you're stopping and you're getting a burn. So, yeah, I, yeah. I'm, I'll work really hard and I'll try really hard, but I'm not diving on the ground. That's for, that's for damn sure. <laughs> <laughs> no, that, that's Hey, that's, that makes perfect sense. And I, think, I hope no one was injured in that tournament. I feel like the risk of injury could be high, but maybe you guys you know, were lucky. Yeah, I don't, nobody got injured, but it's still happening. You know, it still goes on every year. And Oh, oh yeah, it's an, it's an every year thing. Um, there's this guy, Eli. Yep, Eli's yeah, Eli's the man, the Tiki Tom, Tonkas. Tiki Tomba? Tiki Tonkas? <laughs> One of those. But that's his team, and they and they okay. win because they're really good. They are really good, and I really expected to go there and it to be like, you know, guys who weren't very good, but they they're they're good players. You know, they're they're solid mm, volleyball, volleyball players, players for sure. Gotcha. Yeah. So then, okay, let's let's shift away from that amazing story, <laughs> and maybe let's shift to a little bit of your AVP experience because you definitely had a lot of success, success there as well. And also on the Jersey circuit with Gav and JSVBA, I think. So maybe just tell us a little bit about what was it like to compete in qualifiers and, you know, compete against the best of the best in New Jersey and on the national scene. What was that like for so you? So just to be clear, I didn't have a lot of success on the AVP tour. Um, I qualified, I qualified one mm-hmm. time in Virginia beach. That's hey, that's so, so yeah, I, I got a, my best is a, a 17th. So at that time it was a 25 team draw. So, you know, yeah, I was or a 32 team draw. So I won a match and I got a 17th. So that was like, that was my life goal. Like that was what I would always strive mm-hmm. to do. You know, I was like, if I could make an AVP, that would be awesome to win a game in the AVP. That was, that was incredible. Uh, but in terms mm-hmm. of, you know, just Jersey shore volleyball, um, you know, so many memories and, and so much hard work. And uh, can you just repeat the question, Rohan? I'm sorry, man. I got off on the tape. <laughs> no worries. So I think you had a lot of success on the Jersey circuit. So I know you played with a couple of partners, Mike Salik, Matt Ogan. You know, what, what were some of the special moments of those partnerships and how did you achieve all that success? Yeah, so um, it really all started with, uh, with Tony Yates, my high school partner who played with mm-hmm. freshman year. He went off and played with a few other guys for a few years and then, when I was 20, I, I won my first tournament in Atlantic City. So that was a, a really special, really special tournament for me. I'll never forget that. Um, I also, the, the AC big no, shot it one. wasn't a big shot. It was, uh, yeah, I actually never won the big shot. I lost in the finals once. Um, mm. But that was, that was like a small you know, tournament in AC. And that time, Atlantic City was not a big draw for teams. So I think there might have been like 10 teams mm-hmm. in the tournament, but it was my first win. So that was like what catapulted me to, to feel like I really could do this thing. Um, so, mm. so Tony was the first one, and we, we had a run. We probably had five years where, where it was us against um, Mike Salek and, and uh, Sadu Ajanico, and we battled with them in tournaments. And every time they were at a tournament, we lost in three. I don't think we beat them one single time for the whole three mm-hmm. years that we battled against them. But if they weren't there, we won. If you know, And if we were there, then they won. So, <laughs> um, And that was, that was just awesome because Tony and I were two 5'9", five, 5'10 five, guys going against Mike Salek, who's 6'3", you 6'4", know, six, six, one of the best to probably ever play the game in the, the tri-state area. Um, Seydoux, who's just a beast who could just thunder a ball. Um, and we just – it was always just a good time. And the best part was that the camaraderie was there. And, and we were all just best friends afterwards. And, and the competition was intense. But at the end of it, you go to the players' party, you have a couple beers, and, and you enjoy it, right? And you, and you have a good time afterwards. Mm-hmm. So you know, the volleyball was, yeah. was always there and the comp- competition was always important. Um, but then you know, being able to spend time with people that you care about and that you love and, and you, you like to hang out with, that was really, really what it was about for me. You know, mm-hmm. the success, the success was only on the volleyball court was only part of it for sure. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, so then maybe could you walk us through your favorite memory or your favorite win and, you know, what, what made it so special? Was it your first one or was it maybe your last one or like what, what was your 
ultimate favorite win? Man, my favorite win. Um, all right. Um, it was in Brigantine. In two, I hate was, that place. There's like 50 mile per hour winds yep, all the time. That's exactly <laughs> what this story has to tell. Um, so I just come back from the AVP and I would, I had played with Matt and we had qualified and got a 17th, which is amazing. And I came back and I played with my boy, Tony again, who was, who was back for like the weekend. And we said, you know, like you said, like 40 mile an hour wins, ridiculous. And we're playing Shane and Chris. So Shane Donahue and Chris Braid. Uh, yep. Um, and we're down like, we're down like 20 to 14. We're down 2014. Um, they serve me from the good side. I side out. Go to the bat. Uh, go. We go to the good side um, at 2015, and the wind was so ridiculous that I served. I think I served seven aces um, to win the game. <laughs> or maybe, I think it was, no. You know what? I think it was a game to 28, and it was like 27, 20, you know, 20 or 21. Um, and I served seven aces, and we won the game by two. It was like 30 to 28 in this ridiculous. Oh my against, god! Against Shane and Chris, who you know, I I never beat Shane and Chris. I never beat Shane. Shane is mm-hmm. Shane's unbelievable. Chris, you know, I have I beat him sometimes. He beats me sometimes. But you know, that was uh, with my boy Tony to come back like that and win that tournament. Mm-hmm. That was that was awesome for me. Yeah, that's like a full circle thing. It's like you and Tony started out together, weren't the best, but then you know down the road the, the dots all connected and you guys managed to, to get yeah, that. Yeah, I mean that's you know now that now that I'm thinking about it more, it's like there's so many tournaments that that I just forgot about just now. Like there's Newport tournaments that I play with Mike that I love. There's a Newport tournament that I played with Tony that we were down big and and came mm-hmm. back and it's just there's just so many good memories and so many awesome times. And to be honest with you, a lot of them were not necessarily wins. Like like my favorite mm-hmm. tournament was the one that I played with Mike in the big shots, I think in like 2012, maybe 13. And we lost in the finals and that was me. That was my fault. We were up big game one and, and you know, I got dug a few times and they, they won game one, we won game two. And then I just got aced off the court game three. But you know, that tournament big shot was, that was baller. I wish I could have won one. Mm. to regret for gotcha hey it's not too <laughs> late you can always win you, you still got listen time. As, as long as shane donahue keeps on going out and playing these tournaments i, I think i'm in trouble <laughs> we're gonna get him on the podcast we'll see we'll see what his uh five-year plan is coming up because he got some he has a little couple kids too so the kid doesn't he, age though he just gets better like... <laughs> that's true <laughs> that is true so then, okay, I know we're getting closer. We're creeping towards that hour mark, so I want to be respectful of your time. But as we wrap up you know, this beach segment, is there anything else that you'd want to mention to anyone coming up? Or just like what, what, what was the big takeaway from your, your beach career? Like if you walk off the beach, what's, that, what's the main principle or a big lesson that you really learned from you know, adopting this game and becoming really good so at it? So I think the, the biggest thing that I really enjoyed about beach and which kind of I credit for my success and, and something I really kind of disliked about indoor is the fact that you have to be an all around player on the beach. Um, now the indoor game has become where you're either, you know, a huge outside hitter, middle opposite. You can't even be a, you know, a shorter setter to be successful. So, you know, my height would be limiting me to, to pretty much libero exclusively. So, so beach was something that, you know, it, you can, you can manipulate the game to work to your advantage. Um, and what I mean by that is, like I said, I'm not the biggest guy, I'm not the strongest guy, but you know, if I can, if I can serve hard and put you, you know, on your heels, at least from the first touch, yeah. it gives me a better opportunity for success and a better chance to score a point. Um, it's not always going to happen like that and I'm going to miss my serves. Sure. But you know, if I can side out, if I can just put the ball where I need to go, it needs to go and, and not necessarily hit it super hard, but place it well away from other people and see the court, um, you know, it, it gives you a chance. And, and that's what really was always fun for me. Because like I said, I'm not the flashiest guy. I'm not the guy who's going to dig a ball in the back line and you know, have a set come over my head and, and hit a ball from 10 feet off and crush it you know, back hard. That's, that's not me. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm the guy who's, who's digging that ball and then cutting it as short as I can, hoping that they're not there. Yeah. <laughs> but, but you, know, you, yeah. you do it in, enough and you, you, you play chess instead of checkers. And you know, like I said, it gives you a chance at least. So uh, I always enjoyed that. It was always fun for me because I never felt like I was out of the game. And 
it was really enjoyable for me knowing that like, especially going back to serve with the wind in my face, um, you know, with the game on the line where if I serve an ace, the game's over. I know that people are, are not going to be happy about that situation. Um, and that's, mm. and that's like that intensity and that fire that, that grows in you, that, that like winning mentality of like, it, it's do or die right now. So mm-hmm. I would just say to answer your question a little bit shorter way is just play, play, play to your strengths. <laughs> And, and master what you feel like it makes sense to master. Like, I'm not going to go out there and, and try to block. It just doesn't make sense for me. I could do it, sure, but is it going to be successful? No. I'm going to be much more successful on defensive end. Uh, and, mm-hmm. you know, and obviously I'm going to play with guys who are bigger than me because, you know, I, wa- I want to get served, but I also want to play gu- with guys that are bigger than me who can set. Because if, you if you're a big guy and you can't set, I'm in trouble. You know, I'm done. So yeah. it's, it's, you got to think of it strategically. You got to think of it to your advantages. And and you just gotta gotta love it, and that's that's all yeah. I can say about it. I gotcha. Um, no, I love the way you described it as chess over checkers, and I think that's something. Everyone who's learning the game and continuing to want to get better at the game, that's that's the way they should look at it as yeah. well. Yeah, you don't Fair always point. have to put the ball away. You just have to put the ball in a place where it's difficult for them to get it, where they can't put it into a better spot. Because if you're giving up three balls all day, that's that's gonna be that's gonna be a tough day for you. Yeah. Yep. So then, okay, cool. I think that's going to wrap up all my questions for volleyball. But before I let you go, there is my last segment that I wanted to, you know, you get a little bit of choice in this one. So it's basically, you get to choose between rapid fire questioning or you can do the, are you smarter than a fifth grader right. segment? So you can I say rapid person. fire. Definitely, definitely not smarter okay. than a fifth grader. <laughs> no one has, no one has chosen that so far. So we'll see who's going to be the first <laughs> race world. But all right, yes, are you go. ready? All right. What song is stuck in your head uh, right now? Hotel California. Favorite drink? Uh, beer. Fancy beer. What kind? So, so right now okay. it's an Equilibrium Fractal Mandelbro. Oh my god, that's yeah. really fancy. I just I just drink that that nasty stuff yeah. still. Okay. Anyways, are you a morning person or morning a night person? Owl? Definitely. Do pineapples belong on pizza? No. All right, you can get off my show too. I don't like this. I'm <laughs> uh, favorite vacation destination? Um, Florida. Deerfield. Deerfield Beach. Okay. Gotcha. Favorite comedian? Uh, right now, Chris D'Elia. Oh, that's so funny. I was watching uh, a little bit of his Yeah, I didn't, I didn't think it was great. I don't think it's funny. I think he's much funnier on his podcast, personally. Oh, okay. What, what's the name of that Congratulations. Podcast? Okay, just to check it out. Also, is he the is he the same guy in in that show? You that's him. I don't right? think so. I haven't seen you because you know not not having Netflix. But okay. I, I don't I don't think okay. it's him. I think it's just a guy who looks like him. Okay, all right, that that could be it because he looked just like him. I was like, hmm. Okay. Anyways, yep. last question. Sure. Okay, here we go. High line, cutty, or ten foot line? High line all day. Highline all day. Have you speaking of Highline? Have you been or have you have you heard about the new facility that's opened up? Highline I have not. Arena? Where is that? It's in um, in Aberdeen, uh, so like in yeah. Oldbridge. We have a we have our very own indoor sand facility now. Yes, so okay. everyone. Yes, so I, I have heard of Highline. Um, I was thinking like okay. Highline and like the city. Um, so the reason I the reason I say oh, Highline yeah. is because it's the most difficult shot to dig. Number one, hmm. I think you ask anybody, it's definitely the most difficult to, shot to dig. Because mm-hmm. you think you have it and you take your steps and you're like, oh, never I mean, to get there. If you hit a deep, pulse. deep line shot, like, it, it, yeah, it's, even if you do get a dig on it, it's not going to be pretty. So <laughs> that, that's why high line all day. Angle, you know, you can, you can read into the angle. You can cut that. You can take a step into it, but High line, yeah, that's that's me, and I'm definitely not the guy who's pounding a ball for sure. <laughs> that's fun. It's fun <laughs> when, when it happens, and it definitely surprises people when it happens. It happens so rarely, mm. but um, yeah, definitely not my forte. <laughs> what awesome. Well, Greg, thank you so much for joining us again today. I thought this was amazing, <laughs> and I got to really learn about you. So yeah, appreciate Ron, it, hey, I appreciate it, man. This is uh, this is a lot of fun. Uh, and thanks for taking the interest on me and, and calling me a legend. It's, it always feels nice to be called. <laughs> Hey, I'm coming for that spot though, so don't don't get too. Hey, it's open, man. Go for it. (laughs) Awesome, all right, Greg. Have a great rest of your night. You too, man. Thanks, bro.